We have with us this morning um, three gentlemen, actually, from uh, Faith Bible Camp. I think most of you know uh, David Hartwig, and for those that just said who, uh, Twig. Okay. Um, that's how he was first introduced to me, and when I was sharing with him out there in the foyer that when they first told me his his name, I and then they said Twig. I'm like, okay, I know who you mean now. Uh, we also have with us uh, Bill Burkhead and uh, Tim, forgive me if I mispronounce your last name, but Tim Mannox, okay? Uh, they are on the board uh, with Faith Bible Camp as well. And then uh, Twig is actually is the uh, director of Face Bible Camp, so I'm going to turn this over to Twig. So good morning and welcome. Well, it's good to be back at Prairie Bible. Hello, Ben. Long time no see. Cassie. We grew up with them, so I've got to say hi to them. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm David Hartwig, director out at Faith Bible Camp. I love my job. There's no place I'd rather be than at Faith Bible Camp. Um, We have a fantastic board at Faith Bible Camp. Actually, if we had one more board member here, we could have a quorum and have a board meeting after church. (laughs) Because George Mitchell and Milo and Tim and Bill. So that, your church is very involved at Faith Bible Camp, always has been. We were very excited when you guys decided to join the Faith Bible Conference Association. It means a lot. It may not seem like a lot to you, but it means a lot to us. To have a church as solid as yours say, we want to be an official owner of Faith Bible Camp and have some say in the direction the camp goes and how it's managed and how it's run. That means a lot. It means more than you can imagine to the camp to have you guys involved out there. Bill Burkhead is a retired guy. He retired from Navistar, not a cat guy. My dad was. Okay, but he was a senior analyst, financial analyst with Navistar, and he worked in Indianapolis, he worked in Aurora, and started out, I think, in Canton. But I'll give you a very quick example of, of the quality of board members that we have. We got a survey from the Census Bureau, said it was supposed to take about six hours to complete. And that's for a normal person. Bill had it done in two hours. And it's because of his ability as an analyst to categorize our funds, to categorize all the stuff that he has on these hundreds of spreadsheets. And he was able to pull up the information quickly. He keeps our books meticulously, keeps everything functioning like a clock. And that's, that's a treat. Um, Treasure is probably one of the most overlooked unthankful jobs we have on the board and and he does a great job of it so he was new to the community well not new but he grew up in the community but back said I need to get out and meet our churches and well we'll just let's do a camp tour and today is your turn but the whole purpose of Bill and I going around isn't to fill the pulpit and take the whole service we just wanted to have 10 minutes to say thank you for being part of faith bible camp thank you for being part of our lives we hope that we can be part of the camp, can be part of your lives, and it's appreciated. i got two things I want to tell you about. Family camp is coming up, Memorial Day weekend. And I know the shepherds have two or three cabins already reserved. We're planning on you and all your munchkins. There's stuff to do for everybody. But the rest of you are more than welcome to join them, get a cabin. We have a blast at family camp. It's very informal. We have some chapel times. We have a bunch of games. Time to just hang out and relax with other Christians on a holiday weekend, enjoy swimming, whatever we do out there. It's a lot of fun. The second thing we wanted, we've started something brand new this year, and that's an alumni picnic on September 15th. We want to get all you old-timers back again and, and get you out there, and Mariah, get you guys out there and get you rubbing shoulders with all the people you used to go to camp with, and so we're going to do an alumni picnic. And with that, I'll turn it over to Bill. Say, my name is Bill Burkhead. I'm in the treasurer, as, as Twig said. And uh, when I retired uh, with 36 years at Navistar, I, uh, and we moved back home uh, to where my wife and I are both from, uh, you know, we, one of the things we looked forward to in retirement was 
you know, how can we serve? How can we find ways to volunteer? Uh, and I had an idea that there's probably a, a greater demand for an old accountant uh, as a volunteer than there was working. So I quickly found out, uh, even though I, I said, I told my wife I'd like to take a little time, we were building a house, and I'd like to take some time and learn about the camp. I knew a little bit about it. I grew up going to a church camp, not that one, but I knew the value of a church camp, and I knew about Faith Bible Camp because of my, a lot of my family members went there. Uh, cousins and my uncle was involved and uh, I thought you know I'll take a little time and find out what that's all about and see if there are any opportunities there and and God's timing was different than mine and uh, my uncle and my pastor both uh, tapped me on the shoulder within a day of each other and said hey would you be interested in coming onto the board and and being our treasurer so that's kind of how I became involved in Faith Bible Camp, and it's, it's been a wonderful ride. Uh, there's some wonderful things going on there. And uh, I, uh, this is week number six in a row of our, church, of our church visits. There are 13 member churches, and one of the things that I'm enthused about is the enthusiasm that we get from the different member churches and their people for the camp. And uh, it just fills our hearts as a board to know that our member camps, uh, our member churches and their congregations are enthused as we are about what's going on at Faith Bible Camp. And say we really wanted an opportunity. We have a fundraising banquet. We have a harvest dinner uh, where we get to all come together, but not everybody can make it to those. And we felt like it was important to come out to all of our member churches and say thank you. Uh, <clears throat> we couldn't do it without you is an overworked phrase, but it's very true. Uh, the, the funding for Faith Bible Camp comes about not exactly equal thirds, but close from camper fees, uh, from money paid by the member churches, and then individual donors, most of which <coughs> are from our member churches as well. And <clears throat> the camp could not exist on camp fees at all, uh, only. It, it, it wouldn't be there. So it's, it's truly a partnership uh, of Faith Bible Camp and our member churches and the congregants that are individual donors as well. And we just want to be able to come out in person and say thank you. Uh, uh, as we <coughs> exist as a partnership, we see our roles also as partnerships. The, the campers, you know, from what we've seen over the years uh, that where you work the best in, a, in the life of a camper and his Christian walk is when there's an engaged family, when there's an engaged home church, and when there's an engaged camp. So we're all working together for what's going on with the uh, youth uh, and the counselors that come to Faith Bible Camp. So it's, it's truly a partnership all the way around, financially and, and in the lives of our campers. So uh, we just want to say thank you and we appreciate you and it's it's an honor to be here and uh and know that you're invested in in what we're doing out there so thank you okay if you have questions after the message today you can talk to any one of the board members or myself it's kind of like a mini camp reunion here today so that's kind of exciting yeah we have a limited number of camper RV sites. They don't have septic, but they do have power. So you you wouldn't be able to use to hook up to a septic, but you'd hook you can hook up to power that would run your air conditioner or whatever. And we've got three or four spots for those. So yeah, a good idea to bring a camper if you have a nice camper and you want to bring it out and stay in it. You can do that as well. And and I really stress that family camp is a very fun time for families. It's chance for the kids to all play together and get to know each other. It's a chance for the parents to hang out and make friends that may only live 10, 15 miles down the road from you. Today, the message that I'm going to bring is kind of the philosophy behind what we do at Faith Bible Camp. And Tim's probably heard this talk 10 times. Ben might even have heard it back if he remembers way back. Because when I started the job in 1998, I, I was living up in Wheaton, 
and I was being discipled by the Institute of Evangelism director for the Billy Graham Association, and he had challenged me to come up with a mission statement, a purpose for my life, because my main goal, I told him, was to finish well. And I'd come up with five points that I could put on paper that I could work towards to make sure I finished well. One of them we talked about in Sunday school today, and that was be transparent, let your little light shine. And we talked about being salt and light. But then I got the call from the camp board to be the director of Faith Bible Camp, which was like a lifetime dream. That's what I went to college and studied was camping and recreation. Worked at some big camps, but my heart was always at Faith Bible Camp. And it was a dream come true to be a full-time director of Faith Bible Camp and work out there. Our banquet theme this year was look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith comes from Hebrews chapter 12. I'll read verse 1 and verse 2. Therefore, since we are, and this is right after the Hall of Fame, the, all those pillar people that are anchors, people we can look back in, in history and time and see. It's called the, the faith chapter. Very famous people throughout the Bible. And then he goes on, he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, the race of life, basically, and how you're going to finish. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. As a believer... Someday you are going to go and see the throne of God in person. You will stand there and be amazed as you get to look at the throne of God. It's a promise that we have. So that's kind of our theme for the whole year coming at Faith Bible Camp. But I want you to, I want you to see if there's a big iceberg sitting there and our camp is what sticks out of the water. That's what the kids see. That's what the parents see. That's what a lot of the counselors see. But what's underneath the surface? What makes Faith Bible Camp special? What makes it a holy place set apart, set apart by a simple farmer who donated the land years ago and said, let's make a youth camp that glorifies God? What's underneath the surface? And I'm a big movie buff. Some of you may have seen a Joe, a Joe Pesci movie with, with honors. He's a bum. He's lost his home, he's lost his wife, he's lost his kids, he's living in the streets at Harvard University, and he steals a kid's term paper, and the kid needs it back to graduate with honors. The name of the movie is With Honors. And the whole movie is this bum giving one page at a time back of his thesis so this kid could graduate with honors. This bum has historic moments in his life, and he picks up a rock off the ground, when something big in his life happens, puts it in a little pouch and he carries it around in his pocket. At the end of his life, at the end of the movie, when he dies, he has a bag of rocks. And that movie struck me as a fantastic movie, but when I, when I graduate life, I want more than a bag of rocks. You know, I'm going to see the throne of God. And underneath the surface of Faith Bible Camp, that's why it's there. So that our kids that come to camp can gain the assurance of salvation that they will see the throne of God, that Jesus is the author and perfecter of their faith. Another movie I really like is Somewhere in Time with Christopher Reeve and Jane Seymour. And they're living their life, but Christopher Reeve is in the present, she's in the past, and all Christopher Reeve can think about is getting back to the past. And for a lot of us, our past controls everything about our future. And God doesn't want us to live that way either. Then there's another movie, which was a cool movie, um, Back to the Future. And a guy in the present gets stuck in the past, and he lives the rest of that movie trying to, to live life in the future. And that's not where God wants us either. He wants us right now running the race and, and figuring out. But time messes with us. Time has a, a weird way of rearranging all of our priorities in life. For example, let's say you had a rich cousin you didn't know about, and they just today told you that you inherited a million dollars. 
and you could spin it on anything you wanted to, no restrictions. What are some things you could spend a million dollars on? I can tell you my list. I made a list. Cars, a boat, a house, trips and travel. I could easily spend a million dollars doing all that stuff. But then time gets rearranged as priorities in life happen. I grew up as a missionary kid in West Africa in Nigeria. And on our compound, a virus went through, kind of like the Ebola virus that Africa deals with now. It's called the Lhasa virus. And if you got that virus, you had 14 days left to live. And the last 10 of them were not very pleasant. And if somebody came out and said, that million dollars you just inherited, would you give it up if you could get the vaccine that could cure you from the loss of virus and give up the house, the boat, the yard, the cars, all that stuff? You probably would. So if we're going to run the race of life, we've got to get our priorities straight. If we're going to see the throne of God in person... We have to get rid of the stuff that's not essential and hang on to that that's essential. Jeremiah 29, a famous verse. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. It's plan to give you a future and a hope, basically. As Christians, we're promised a future and a hope. And all we have to do is run the race of life. And everyone in this room knows that there's problems with running the race of life. It's not easy. We want to finish well, we want to run the race, but stuff gets in the way. Cuts in and entangles us up, sets us back. And out at Faith Bible Camp, I love it because we have the rule time, don't we? When kids all come to camp, and I've changed that a little bit. I don't, I don't like sitting there for 45 minutes going over rules that you have to obey to have fun at Faith Bible Camp. So I've come up with two sets. There are the rules, and then there are the guidelines. The rules are things you have to obey. The guidelines are things that are going to keep you out of trouble. Like you need to wear your shoes because if you don't and you're running around the lake, people fish and they drop fish hooks and you might get a fish hook in your foot. If you want to stay out of trouble and don't want to have to go to the nurse's station, wear your shoes because you might get a fish hook. Same way you can't fish off the beach because if your line breaks... Some kid's going to step on your fish hook. Those are guidelines that will keep you out of trouble. We have two rules that are non-discretionary, that are mandatory when a kid comes to Faith Bible Camp. And they come from the scriptures. First one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. It comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6. That's an easy rule, right? No. The second rule, rule number two at Faith Bible Camp... Love your neighbor as yourself. That comes from Leviticus chapter 19. Jesus even reinforced those two rules in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 22, he says, All of the law and all of the prophets hang on these two rules. So if our kids can come to camp and love God and love their neighbor, we should be okay. And all of you know... Something cuts in and cuts us off and entangles us and it gets messed up. And most of you in this room probably know that's a result of the fall. Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. They broke that relationship with God. Garden of Eden was no longer perfect. Now we are born into a fallen race. We are born into a fallen world. G.K. Chesterton, an old philosopher and pastor, the Christian life... Or the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and left untried. So running that straight race of life to the throne of God is very difficult. It's very hard. Especially when you start life separated from God. Romans 3.23, you all know that. For, the, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But then there's a solution, there's the hope. For the wages of sin might be death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. We have a solution 
and we have the opportunity to have a growing personal relationship with God. Another play, which was turned into a movie, Les Miserables. Um, You've got the law character, Javert. He's the sheriff. He's by the book, black and white, no gray areas. You need to be punished for your wrongdoing. And then you've got the Jean Valjean character who has been shown grace by the priest and is living life in a grace mentality. It's a fantastic play if you've never seen it. I'd encourage you to go see Les Miserables. But it sets up this verse, Galatians chapter 5. So I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to sinful nature. So we have a choice. We can be black and white, straight down this row, no gray areas. We can be the law. And every one of us in this room would fail to live up to all the laws that we are supposed to obey. Not one of us, other than Christ alone, was able to live up to the requirements of the law. We are all, as Christians, living by grace. I want you to do this example. I want, I want you to show you how this happens. 95% of everything we do in our life is a habit. So I want you just to fold your hands like you're going to pray. Cross them up. All right? Now put your hands apart again. Now when you put your hands together this time... Put your other thumb on top. Do you know that when you fold your hands, it's a habit? And you can actually think back and know which thumb you had on top and know which to switch. 95% of everything you do in your life is a habit. And that means that living your Christian life should become a habit. If 95% of everything we do is a habit... You should have developed some of these things in our life. And this is where I started studying and coming up with what do I need to do to have a game plan for my life to make sure I finish well. But underneath the surface of Faith Bible Camp, I've just kept these same truths and kept them going at Faith Bible Camp. There's five of them. The first one is very simple. Ground yourself in reliable theology. Sounds very simple. Colossians chapter 3 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts. Simply build your life on reliable theology. In Sunday school I mentioned the five solas of the Reformation. This is the 500th anniversary of the Reformation this year. Here's the five solas. Underneath the surface of all the games and activities and all the stuff we do at camp on our missions trips to Romania, underneath the surface of everything that happens, it's all based on the Word of God. And the Reformation was based on five points. One was everything through Scripture alone, through Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, for the glory of God alone. And if everything we do at Faith Bible Camp, if everything we do in your life is grounded in reliable theology, that's the best start you have in running your race, the way that God wants you to run it. So ground your life in reliable theology. In all of our activities, in all of our teachings, in all of our stuff we do at camp, <coughs> is it grounded in the Word of God? The second one we talked about in Sunday school this morning. And I just call it be transparent, let your little light shine. It's based on Matthew chapter 5. It says, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a light on a lamp and set it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a, hit, on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. We need to live our life with an abundance mentality. We need to live our life thinking that we're going to stay on track. We need to live our life so that other people see God's work in our lives. That's that's one of the reasons, if you talk to kids over the years, what makes camp so special 
It's the, it's the relationships they've had with their junior counselors, with their counselors, the game leaders, the other kids in the cabin, the cooks, the lifeguards, the nurse. It doesn't matter. When you come to Faith Bible Camp, you're rubbing shoulders with Hall of Fame people. They're there because they love God. They love there. They love the kids. But point two, everyone who works at Faith Bible Camp needs to really let their light shine. They need to have that salt in their life. They need to turn that light loose and let it shine. Pillar number three or point number three, use your power of choice to do the right thing. And I love these verses from Deuteronomy chapter 30. It says, This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that, the, that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life. So use your power of choice to do the right thing, to choose to do the right thing. You can have blessings or curses. It says right here, choose life. That's a good thing. Then I like the story of Martha in Luke chapter 10. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Jesus was in their house, and Jesus didn't want so concerned with the dust on the back windowsill. He was more concerned about having a relationship with Mary and Martha. And keeping a nice house is, is important. Keeping the details of running your church, of running the camp are important. That's why we have a camp board. That's why we have guidelines and procedures. But the heart and soul is the relationships that are built that direct people to our Lord and Savior Christ. Another book I'm fascinated by is Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. And Viktor Frankl survived a German Holocaust concentration camp. And he was a PhD in psychology. And he wrote a book and he, he observed in a Nazi prison camp that there were men, two mentalities basically you could have as you go through the race of life. And they were looking at the end of life, most of them. And he said there were some people who got up, I got to get up this morning, I have to go to breakfast, I have to stand in this formation, I have to do this, I have to do this, I have to do this. He even comments in the book that when that got to be such a drudgery that the people who smoked were willing to give up their cigarettes, that meant that their time on earth was just about done. They got to do this, they got to do, and he calls it the I got us. But there's also the I choose to, a stimulus and a response. Then he said there were people in the concentration camp that chose to get up every morning to live life with a purpose. His dream in surviving a Nazi prison camp was that when he got out of that prison camp, he was going to take all those notes and all those observations he had taken about human behavior and human performance, and he was going to write a book about it. And his book was Man's Search for Meaning. So we get to choose how we run the race of life. You gotta have devotions. You gotta go to church. You gotta go to Sunday school. You have to raise your kids this way. Or I choose to get up every morning and glorify God with everything I do. I choose to raise a family and choose a church that is going to be Bible based and preach the Word of God. Those what a difference that makes in your life. So use your power of choice to do the right thing. And number four, sometimes making the right choice is hard. You don't know what to do. And I remember out at Faith Bible Camp, I was probably all of 12 years old maybe. I memorized the Bible verse. And it said this, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it shall be given to him. And as a 12 or 13 year old, I remember praying that prayer. The Bible says, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. <coughs> and as a 12 year old, I was smart enough to understand if the Bible says ask God, that means pray. And I specifically remember praying and asking God for wisdom on how to live my life. Because as a 12 year old, 
You have a lot of stuff you have to obey. You have a lot of choices you get to make. Proverbs 16, 16 says, How much better to get wisdom than gold to choose understanding rather than silver. So point four for me and point four for Faith Bible Camp is encourage our kids to pursue godly wisdom and understanding. Just reading a Bible verse is okay, but understanding the Bible verse is better and applying that to your life so that you can make godly decisions is better yet. So pursue wisdom and understanding. And then my fifth point was it's okay to know all this stuff, but you have to, have a, you have to design a game plan in your life to make sure that you finish well. How are you going to do it? The how-tos and the whys and what-ifs and how, what's my game plan? What's the plan of action? And that's where we came up with the verses today. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked before us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So if my question is, what do you want to be when you grow up at the end of your life? And I remember one time telling a class of fifth graders at Galesburg Christian School, you know what I wanted to be when I grew up? I wanted to be a fifth grader because it was my favorite year in school. There was no grade better than fifth grade. And probably eight years later, that teacher ran into me in Galesburg, and she goes, you know, you said a quote one time that was one of the best quotes I've ever heard, and that was when you said when you grew up you wanted to be a fifth grader. But what do you want to be at the end of your life? When they are having your funeral service, what are they going to say about you? And I, I read a book one time, and it was told a story of little Louie. And little Louie wasn't the best student. He graduated near the bottom of his class from high school. He wasn't dumb. He just wasn't that into schoolwork. And he got a job out of college and he got fired. And at that point in his life, he had a wife and kids, starting life, starting a career. He had just been fired. And his wife said, Louie, you need to make a list of what you want to accomplish in life. What do you want to be, do, or have? And this is something our camp board has done multiple times since I've been the director there. We, do, we have a list. We've done it multiple times. What do we want Faith Bible Camp to be, do, or have? And we give them points and number it. When, and if somebody says, oh, we really think you ought to have a swimming pool. We say, well, here's where a swimming pool came out on our evaluation. And here's 18 things or 100 things that are more important than a swimming pool right now. So it kind of keeps you on track. Little Louie, he made his list of a hundred things that he wanted to be, do, or have. And let me read you some of the things that are on his list because it's crazy. Absolutely crazy. He wanted to jump out of an airplane. He wanted everyone to know he had jumped out of an airplane at the end of his life. He wanted to hit a hole in one in golf. He wanted to have dinner with the President of the United States. He wanted to be a great college coach. He wanted to win a national championship, and he wanted to be named Coach of the Year. Now remember, this is a guy who had just been fired from his job, and his wife said, make a list of 100 things you want to be, do, or have. Is there anyone here who knows who I'm talking about? Lou Holtz, coach at Notre Dame. When he was fired from his first job, and he made a list of what he wanted the end of his life to look like. And those were some of the things that were on his list. And he accomplished every single one of those. <coughs> what do you want to be, do, or have in your spiritual life? And here's some, some suggestions. Write it down. Prioritize them. Develop milestones. And develop action steps. In other words, <coughs> goals and objectives. You hear it all the time. What's... what's if you could paint a picture outside that back door of what your life looks like, what's that picture look like? And then develop steps to get there. 
When you know what your plan is, it's easy to say yes and it's easy to say no. That helps you make wise decisions. It helps you choose to do the right thing when you have a game plan for doing it. I have a friend who's an airline pilot, and he let me fly his World War II bomber. Well, it wasn't his. It was his company's. He took off, and he did the landing, but I got to steer it over Lake Michigan, delivering car parts to Detroit from Janesville, Wisconsin. And it was nighttime, and there was this little dot and these little wing picture things, and all I had to do was follow that little dot and keep the wings straight. I thought I was doing a pretty good job. And my buddy Rex says, Twig, you're going to miss Detroit by 200 miles. You need to get your wings straight. And I'm like, yeah, but that doesn't feel right. I'm, I feel like I'm sitting crooked. No, he says, you've got to keep your wings straight. And he said, you have to keep on that dot. And as a pilot, he knew keeping those instruments on the exact track of where you're supposed to have them will guarantee that you end up at your destination where you're supposed to be. If your wings are tipped a little bit, you're going to fly around in a circle. If your dot is only a millimeter or two millimeters off your dead center, you're going to miss Detroit. And to me, it wasn't that big a deal. I was close, but to a pilot, that frequent feedback, that's what I'm getting at is frequent feedback, evaluation. How do you know if you're working towards your goal of being a, finishing your life well, you need frequent feedback. You need Sunday school. You need church. You need accountability. You need a Christian network. That little, I call it the do or die test. What do you need to do right? What do you need to do differently? I'm going to start winding up with a story. But first I want to read you Ephesians 6. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. It goes all the way back to point number one. Ground yourself in reliable theology. Ephesians 6 tells you to put on the full armor of God and all that stuff. And it's, that's, your, that's how you are supposed to be dressed. That's your uniform that you're going to wear in running the race of life. There's the helmet of salvation. There's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. All this stuff all connects. So what's, what stands between you and getting to the end? Sometimes it's fear of failure. What if I start this path and like, like Christian in Pilgrim's Progress, you get sidetracked. But he always seems to get back on the path and keep heading towards the celestial city. Sometimes it's just being ridiculed by other people. We've seen some pretty famous Christians recently on TV get ridiculed by the news pundits. Um, Vice President was ridiculed because he has a relationship with Christ and he prays and talks to God. Don't let that sidetrack you. Fear of the unknown. It takes me places I've never been before. But ultimately... Just like in Pilgrim's Progress, it begins at the cross of Christ. That's where his burden is taken off, and he is free to make the journey to the celestial city. Somewhat more modern-day example to finish out. The year was 1912. Dr. Robert Bateman was a minister in Jacksonville, Florida. He operated the Central City Rescue Mission. He died on the USS Titanic. He was body number 174 of 306 recovered. There was a reason that Dr. Bateman, a minister, was on the Titanic. Years before, here's a letter he got from a prostitute in Jacksonville, Florida. It says, Dear Dr. Bateman, I hear you are going to start a home for us girls. I want to come to it. I can't do anything that is worth anything to anybody. I've tried to leave here, but nobody will give me work. This place is horrible, and I know lots of girls will come. For God's sake, do something quick from a certain house on Davis Street. That letter convicted Dr. Robert Bateman, and he went to England where a guy named George Mueller was running an orphanage for street kids, and he was running it completely on faith. Name of our camp is Faith Bible Camp. 
Bill talked about how we can't afford to run camp on just what we charge for camper fees. George Mueller did the same way with his orphanage. And sometimes they would be praying for the meal as the meal would arrive at the door. And Dr. Bateman said, I need to learn this kind of faith. If I'm going to start a home for prostitutes, for girls to get them off the street, it's going to have to be a faith-based ministry. I'm going to have to go learn from somebody who's doing it how to do it. Years and years, I started out talking about movies, and I'm going to end talking about a movie. They made a movie called Titanic. And in the movie, there's, you know, they researched the story of the Titanic. What were the big stories that happened on the Titanic? If we're going to make this movie, how are we going to make it real? Let's interview passengers. What were the big events that happened on the Titanic? One of the big events that made the movie, there was a church service. On the Titanic, the only church service ever preached on the Titanic. Guess who the pastor was? Dr. Robert Bateman from Jacksonville, Florida, preached a sermon on the Titanic. He closed the sermon with a hymn, Nearer My God to Thee, a song we still sing in churches today. Um, as the ship was sinking, after it hit the iceberg, and as it's going down, in the movie, there are men hanging on to the rails, knowing they're going to die. And in the movie, they are quoting the Lord's Prayer. Guess who was the leader in quoting the Lord's Prayer as the ship was sinking and who had stayed on the boat, knowing he was going to die? Dr. Robert Bateman quoting the Lord's Prayer as the men were dying. Then if you know the story of the Titanic, there was an orchestra left on board, and they were going to die. And Dr. Robert Bateman asked them if they would play a hymn. Do you know what the hymn was? It was Nearer My God to Thee. The orchestra was playing as the ship was sinking and men were dying. And Dr. Bateman died on that ship. But years later, when Hollywood needed to make a movie and they needed to make it emotional and they needed to make it real, one simple pastor from Jacksonville, Florida, made four or five scenes in the movie, and that's what made life real. He lived a life and finished well, and that's what we can do. We can finish our life well. Close with this verse, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 through 8. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to, have lo- who all, to all who have longed for his appearing. I'm thankful today that I had a mentor that convinced me to put down on pen and paper what it would, if I said I wanted to finish life well, what would it take for me to finish life well? And about the time I was finishing that process is about the time the Faith Bible Camp board offered me a job at Faith Bible Camp. And for the last 20 years, my passion has not been playing flag football or playing volleyball or swimming with the kids at camp. It's been instilling in our staff, instilling in our counselors, instilling in the campers the five principles we talked about this morning. Things like grounding them in a reliable theology because some of them don't get it anywhere else. And having having them surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, by a cloud of counselors who are light and salt to them. By helping them to make wise choices. By helping them pursue wisdom and understanding and encouraging them to have their devotions, to have an accountability group, to get them plugged into their local church. Those are the things that are going to get those kids past the finish line. And that's the whole purpose. That's all the stuff that's going on underneath the scenes of just having a youth camp. But that's why kids love Faith Bible Camp. It meant something in their life. Everyone here who's gone through Faith Bible Camp will tell you that it wasn't just the games and the activities. It was the the change in their life that happened to them while they were at Faith Bible Camp. So that's the the under-the-surface stuff. It can be the same way in your life. Finish life well. Let me close in prayer. God, we thank you today. We thank you 
that first off, the scriptures are our roadmap and our guideline. We thank you that it is through Christ alone, by grace alone and faith alone, for the glory of God alone. We thank you that a life based on reliable theology helps us to finish well this race of life. We praise you for that and for this church. In your name, amen.